Constantinople, London, and Grand Rapids. <laughs> Fine company, right? But what do all three cities have in common? Once upon a time, Constantinople was a complete rarity in the world, a grand exception. But today, there are global cities all over the place. These are places of intense diversity where people interact all the time with strangers. We've come to think of the company of strangers as a normal thing, but it's fundamentally a modern thing, something new. And although we think we're comfortable with it, and I would hazard a guess that most of, this people, most of the people in this room uh, are strangers, but are feeling pretty comfortable right now, the fact is, I think we're not fully adapted socially, and I'll elaborate. I work in customer service. I've done so for a long time. And the ubiquity of strangers in customer service changes everything. Brief interactions dominate. In the time it takes me to give this TED talk, a drive through order taker will serve 36 customers. She'll get to know just a little bit about them, but unfortunately, they'll get to know absolutely nothing about her. And this doesn't enable us to build respect and appreciation. These brief interactions, these one-sided interactions, fundamentally leave us strangers without a lot of mutual interests and a lot of mutual connection. The thing is, our environment is more competitive than ever. <coughs> Customers have lots of choices for every service conceivable. So great customer service and wonderful experiences have never been more essential to business success, and they've never been more difficult to achieve. A lot of us are wrestling with this. I know I'm not alone. <laughs> so here's the bad news. The way of the past no longer works, and worse yet, the new way no longer works. When I say the way of the past, hopefully many of you, like me, envision this romantic ideal, the small-town shopkeeper in his apron. He knows his customers' personal preferences. He knows exactly how much credit to extend or not. And, of course, he knows which of their purchasing decisions to keep quiet. Or the community doctor, who serves every member of the family and also your neighbors, and is similarly discreet. This is a romantic ideal, but it's no longer very common. The fact is, the old way was very personal, but it isn't scalable. So let's look at the new way. The new way is scalable, but it's rarely personal. Today, we use repeatable training and different kinds of approaches to help strangers interact quickly with comfort and to try and show care. And I've got to tell you, there are many, many people who do fantastic work, talented people who do fantastic work in this model, people that I work with, people I'm very proud of. But increasingly, we're finding that some actually resist this model. And in many cases, customers and even workers can abuse the model. So we need a better way. As I say, the new way is scalable but rarely personal, and this has extended into our new newest service channels. Most large companies now have one or even many digital manifestations, and they bring with them into those worlds the identity of the company, the reputation of the company, the tone and language, as best you can in a digital environment. And we've also discovered that we can personalize an experience. We can add a name or a face to a profile. And yet it's not quite personal. And sometimes it requires a lot of work from the customer. So if I would like my face in my Amazon profile page, I have to go upload a photo. And if I'd like to look at the products that I myself personally prefer, I'll have to stop letting my children and the rest of my family use the account. <laughs> just clearing that one up for you. <laughs> and then sometimes personalization gets just simply a little nonsensical. This came just in time for this talk today. I received an email to my email address last week, but then the greeting is addressed to my husband. So it's close, <laughs> but it's not quite there. And here's the thing, I wish no ill will 
to anyone working in this field, we're all doing the same thing. And we're all trying very hard to continuously improve and develop better ways uh, and more reliable ways to deliver better experiences. The thing is, we're not always getting the intended outcomes. In fact, we're not getting them as often as we need to. So, as I said, many of us are wrestling with this, and there's an emerging form of conventional wisdom I'll share. There it is. The conventional wisdom that's emerging is that employees should just be themselves, that we take all the artifice away. But I say not so fast, because just being yourself in every situation, well, that poses a conundrum. You're different in different situations, so how should I be? The underlying idea of empowerment, I think that's the right idea. However, I've come to believe that there's a better way, not the old way, that's personal but not scalable, and not the new way that's scalable but not personal, and not a combination, not some sort of hybrid or mixture, but actually something different, and not too terribly complicated. We need to allow workers to develop a style, a style that suits them, but also suits the need, the situation, the context. I freely admit that not everyone, especially in business, likes the word style. So if you're feeling a little uncomfortable with that, uh, that's healthy and normal. But everyone has a style. Everyone has a style, and in fact, most people have multiple styles, right? So the way you are at work and the way you are at home, it's not the same. This elegant woman with the word goofy across, she might be elegant at a business dinner, but goofy with her nephew. So she adopts different styles for different situations. Having a style, it's an act of performance. So maybe that sets a high bar. But it's also an act of agency and creativity, and that's what a lot of people are looking for every day, in their personal lives, in their work lives. Opportunities. So not everyone's going to be a Madonna, and Madonna herself, well, she wasn't born the material girl, she hasn't stayed the material girl, she has evolved, and she's entertained us in the process. You don't have to be that extreme to appreciate it in someone else. Remember these women? They were neutral, they were courteous. Imagine if they could choose their own style. Where might they go? One might be mellow, one might be formal, one might be witty. Regardless of how they're dressed, they can express that. They can bring that to their interactions with others. And it's fun. It's a form of play. They can experiment, they can change it out, they can see what works, gauge reactions. It's empowering and it's a little bit liberating. Day in and day out. One of my favorite McDonald's employees, she's a phenomenal uh, customer service person, she actually interacts with each and every customer a little bit differently. She's in the witty spectrum. She tells little jokes, but based on how they react, she knows where to take it. She's actually changing her style in real time. She's just varying it, and she's very, very well liked. The customers head straight for her. <laughs> now, that's very sophisticated. Not everyone can pull that off, but I guarantee you she didn't do it on day one either. She's developed this style and learned how to do it. Let me tell you a few more stories of people who deliver service with style and make it that much better. Fifteen years or so ago, I lived in New York City, and I worked in design consulting, and we would head out for lunch regularly, and everywhere, it was a mob scene. We often went to a Chinese restaurant down the street, and after you finally slogged your way up to the front counter, you were greeted by the woman that we now fondly refer to as Screaming Lady. Yeah, you've never seen that in a corporate standards manual. <laughs> but she was fantastic. She would take your order very quickly. She would turn around and call it back in her language to the, the kitchen, and then she would ask you your name. And 8, 10, 15 minutes later, however long it took to prepare the food, she would look out over the big crowd. I think it felt as big as this one. And she would point to you, call your name, and you could come up and claim. It was a technical, her technical mastery and, a, and almost a magic capability she possessed that made her so much fun. So interesting to watch 
and frankly, that uh, created confidence in us that we were getting the right food. So in her case, screaming was really not a bad thing. It was fantastic. My upstairs neighbor is a flight attendant, and she has fantastic service style. But I wouldn't have guessed it. I, I didn't think she wasn't good. <laughs> I just imagined that when she went to the job, she was very much the way she was uh, socially. So socially, how is she? She knocks on the front door. She's got a bottle of wine. She shows up to talk, and she's very talkative. She's very lively. She's a little bit loud. One day, I had a chance to fly from New York City to Chicago on one of her flights, and to my utter delight and surprise, I discovered that when she's at work, she's smooth jazz. <laughs> she's lilting and paced and directive and curious and uh, asking you the right question. She's like background music for the flight. Uh, it just so happens with jazz is also her favorite music. <laughs> so maybe there's no coincidence. But uh, you know, she's just very different on the flight and very wonderful. So the good news is that we know great style in service is a best practice. And it's also something that our emerging workforce cares a lot about. When you're a teenager and a young adult, you spend a lot of time and money, frankly, thinking about these things, what kind of music you like, what kind of restaurants you go to, uh, how you fit into the overall social scheme. So it's an area of interest. Plus, we know that our youngest workers are looking for opportunities to be creative, to innovate, and to express themselves even in their work. They don't want to be associated with something cold and impersonal. They're more interested in quirky and authentic. So there's a tremendously nice fit. And I'm still, though, talking mostly about interaction, because even if every uniform in the world were as hip and cool as this one, it wouldn't be as important as having the ability to be creative in, in the interactions. It's the most important part of the empowerment formula. Now, the challenge, and I think some of you in the room do work in larger companies like I do, and so this already may be in your mind. The challenge is that our management model harkens back to that middle place we call small business. In the small business management model, we can place an exemplary role model person in charge. And in a small business context, the retailer might always be present on the shop floor, not in the back. Or during banker's hours, the banker could be available while the bank was open. But nowadays, <laughs> nowadays we have extended hours, call centers, multiple sites, international operations, high volumes. It's just not practical to exert the kind of wise counsel day in and day out for all our employees that we used to. So we still have the model, which emphasizes control and hierarchy, but we also have a new reality. And most of you know that when you have to put the two together, ideal and reality, reality wins. <laughs> so frankly, we almost have no choice but to find a new way to help employees bring style, intelligence, and agency to their work. The exemplars in service and in offering the best service experiences have very, very few rules. One, maybe two, and they usually sound something like this. Use good judgment. Judgment is something that develops over time, but heck, this is great advice. <laughs> I would add one more. Get great results. Looking at the outcome rather than the path to get there sets us up for far greater success with far greater predictability. So one more story, which is really all about results. When I was in graduate school, I did my field research in home care. And I was assigned to follow two foreign-born men who were both physical therapists, treating predominantly low-income elderly patients in their homes. So the work was unsupervised. It was, in some ways, intimate. Physical therapy involves touching, range of motion, helping patients into and out of chairs, that kind of thing. 
Of course, the agency had all kinds of training and all kinds of uh, prescriptions for how things should be done. And as I began to travel around with these two men, I thought one was probably much better than the other. The one I initially appreciated was very professional. I think that was the most important thing to say about him. He was professional with each and every patient, very consistent. The other therapist seemed to me potentially inappropriate. But over time, I realized that when he placed a hand on a knee or on a shoulder unnecessarily, he was actually being tender and establishing rapport with his patients. And they didn't want to disappoint him between visits. They were more likely to do their exercises than the patients of the other therapist. Now, his style, which was affectionate, basically, was not something that the agency could prescribe, not something they could hold all of their employees to, but it was very effective. So I'm calling on all the experienced innovators out there. You may or may not think of yourselves that way, but if you're working in the space and trying to make change every day for interactions among strangers, then we're working together, you and I. A best practice, we know service style is a best practice already. We're still working on how to make it a regular, everyday thing. Earlier this year, at McDonald's, we ran a promotion called Pay-In with Lovin'. The simple mechanics were this. Customers were chosen at random and offered a free meal if they would perform a task that in some way embodied lovin'. So this was an event. It's not something we still do every day. <laughs> but it was a wonderful opportunity, in a way, to prototype this theory. And it worked. Here you see a customer after her task, and you can see, almost as importantly, that the workers are showing their style, their way of appreciating what she's done. In this image, you can see some of our customers uh, rose to the challenge of dancing. And if you had seen her in still, you wouldn't have expected her to have nearly as much of a flair as she, in fact, does. Some customers openly expressed affection. And what I love about this image, and this is from a video I captured the still, is the affection in the worker's eyes. It's fleeting, but it's very genuine. And some workers got in on the action. <laughs> and they probably didn't have to pay for their meal anyway. <laughs> so at McDonald's, at that McDonald's, it was a no-service mistake day. The, ba the barriers were lowered, and the ability to work without inhibition was enhanced. But it's still not an everyday approach, and I'll keep working on that with my colleagues. So as large companies begin to outlive their origin stories, and as idealistic startups confront some of the challenges of growing, getting larger, and being successful, I think we're starting to see an important shift away from mission to values, away from brand ambassadorship to brand participation, and away from image, which can be very static and limiting to experience. When our employees can affiliate with our companies without losing their sense of self, and when they can then bring their creativity to bear, we gain the advantage not, over, not only of better customer experiences, but also of the potential for those employees to engage in solving bigger, more systemic, and sticky problems that they experience on the front lines, but that pervade the business. We have the opportunity to redefine what it means to give great service. And we aim to do that. Thank you. <laughs>